Thank you, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Tony Dowson. I'm Senior Environmental Health Officer at City Council. Environmental health officers cover a range of public health concerns from we do noise control, so something in the region of 12,000 noise complaints a year, right through to housing, hoarders, rubbish, rats, um, and of course complaints about hazardous substances and things like asbestos. Um, our, our role is specifically around providing information to the community on how best to protect themselves, but we also do regulation work. Most of us, uh, most of you may may be familiar with the role of environmental health officers around um, food and um, hotels and things like that. But um, it's a very wide brief. But tonight we're just really going to limit it to talking about asbestos and mould. So I'll take them one at a time. And as Sarah suggested, um, I'm happy to take questions at any time, but um, specifically at the end if if you want um, want to wait till then. Right, um, starting with asbestos, we have probably in the last four years done a big catch up in Christchurch to the point now where we're, our, our level of knowledge, if not comfort, around um, asbestos has improved. Our organisation and integration with other authorities is far advanced in four years than, than I'd ever anticipated. And we're contributing now to um, new regulations that are being formed as we speak. Those regulations might even require people that have asbestos in their home to be um, on a register in the future. So it's it's worth knowing. It's also worth knowing that it's a fairly widespread mineral substance. It's um, in two main forms, but um, and that is the uh, the serpentine asbestos, which we see in um, quite a range of household products, you, you, in our soft furnishings, hard furnishings, wall linings, and um, we also see the really um, the more hazardous forms of asbestos, uh, uh, if, if there is such thing as more um, more hazardous, because. As we know, um, it's not really a dose-dependent thing. You can you can actually be affected on your first exposure to it. Having said that, um, the more you work with it, the greater your chances of um, having an asthma or sorry uh, an asbestos-related issue later in life goes up. So if you're an, uh, an electrician, say, and you're you're regularly crawling uh, under houses or in the attics or putting in down lights, you might be exposed to higher levels of asbestos dust, and it is the dust that we we're most concerned about. Um, we have all types of asbestos in Christchurch, the ranging from the the uh, blue chrysidolite, um, which was used in um, building products for a long time, since the 1930s up to about the 1990s. Any houses that were built will have asbestos in one form or another. It might be anything from um, linoleum tiles through to um, cladding, uh, it can be the pole light that goes on your garage or um, un under the eaves of your house. You can't necessarily know that it's there just by looking at it and going, I think that might be asbestos. The, the, the only true way to know, of course, is to get it tested and, and that's very much what we're recommending. A few years back we wouldn't have had the same resources and laboratories to get the testing done, but now they're springing up everywhere. If you are going to get testing done, it's recommended that you use an accredited laboratory for that. Um, I've got a pamphlet that I'll hand out at the end on removal of asbestos for the homeowner. And it, in that is advice on how to go about it yourself. But um, as I've been discussing with some of my colleagues, we're really getting to a point now where we're getting slightly uncomfortable with people doing their own asbestos work just to save money or a few dollars. Um, it's, it's, it is a job for the professionals and we, we would prefer that they, you go to the Google or the yellow pages and find a removalist that can, can actually undertake the work. But 
having said that, we have um, um, people, because there is such a range of asbestos within households, and it's estimated 40,000 homes in the, in the Christchurch area will have asbestos in one form or another, that you're, you're going to come across it sooner or later and you, you may want to, I don't know, put in a downlight and so you're putting yourself right under the area where the dust will fall if you're using a hole saw or a drill and it's in that more um, fibrous or dust, um, the dust falling on you may, may well expose you at that point. From that point of view, yes, you can wear a mask and you wear all the, the equipment, but why put yourself in that in that position in the first place when for a hundred dollars you can get a, a, a test uh, from from one of the reputable companies and um, at least know what you're dealing with. Asbestos has been around for as long as people have been around, but the um, the study of disease related to asbestos goes right back to ancient times, and even the Greeks were uh, were discovering that people were getting terrible coughs, and I guess in those days they didn't have the same life expectancy, where we see a 30-year latency period for say mesothelioma or or some of those other um, asbestos-related diseases. But over time, the, um, the occupational thresholds have dropped and dropped, and we're now down to the knowledge that even a single fibre can, can, um, can get into your lungs. So with, with, with um, some of the types of asbestos, the small fibres bypass all, all of the defences of the body, the nasal hairs, the mucus and so forth, travel directly to your lungs and irritate the lungs and it may form a cancer sooner or later but uh, um, often the disease like um, is a slowly progressive one uh, where little protein balls fall on form on the end of each um, part of the part of the asbestos particle and eventually build up until a, a matrix or a mat is formed and um, breathing is affected that way. So over the course of 30 years it, 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 it can um, gradually diminish your, your life. A, a, a very big concern but as I said uh, initially it's really people who are working with it all the time that have the most to fear because um, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of paranoia around uh, about asbestos and some forms um, the pole light that we see on garages and so forth, um, I've, uh, if they're intact and, and in good condition, they don't represent a high degree of, of um, threat to anyone. Are there any questions at the stage on the general nature of asbestos? A, is it a New Zealand and some country problem or is it worldwide that asbestos is being used in housing and commercial buildings, residential and commercial buildings? All right, the question is, is um, asbestos uh, specifically a New Zealand issue? No, it's not. Um, it, it, is, it has of recent times gained a lot of... Um, 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 control and uh, um, regulation in England, um, they are on to it and the health and safety in England now has, is probably more advanced than, than we are. They do have registers for asbestos. The only ones that we currently have in New Zealand are around occupational exposure. So if you've been exposed to it or if you actually have symptoms um, medical symptoms and you're being diagnosed with asbestosis or or um, some other cancer. Um, those are the main registers that we, we have in New Zealand but we're moving soon I think to actually have um, a register for the substance itself and its locations. It's um, very widespread throughout the world. Um, big problem in Australia where they've had um, 
uh, asbestos mines and um, you've heard of the Blue Sky Mine. I think a lot of people are familiar with the Midnight Oil lyric, but um, it, is, it has been a, um, a, a, a big issue for the last 20, 30 years there anyway with massive rates of um, death and um, morbidity amongst uh, mine workers in Australia. And even for the environmental side of it, the, the townships around, not just the specific workers, but affecting the families and workers of um, some of these mining towns. And, and it was all, a lot of it was due to a fairly laissez-faire, macho attitude to, I'll be right, I can smoke and I can do whatever I like and handle asbestos, I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, not going to be affected. But I think the, the attitudes have significantly changed in Australia. Likewise, the EPA have picked it up in America and there are some uh, very strong controls there in Europe too. Yeah. Okay, um, I don't want to hold this microphone any longer. <laughs> That's all right. Question, but I've had an asbestos test done through Fletcher's. Okay, I had an asbestos test done by Fletcher's, um, and the tester uh, chipped a piece off the wall and left it on the carpet. Now, um, I thought, well, what am I going to do about this, you know? Because I, at that time I didn't know I had asbestos, but it's been confirmed I have now through asbestos tests. Now, I suspected it could be asbestos, but I just picked it up and I put it in the black rubbish bag. But now I don't know myself. I was going to ring the city council about it, but I thought since I've come here and you've the environmental health officer, I thought, well, uh, senior environmental health officer, I thought that I, um, yeah, I don't know what to do with it, get rid of it. It's just a chip, a small chip that they've chipped off and left on the carpet. Um, and I must say, when I um, uh, asked the, the company, uh, I arranged with the company for the test to be done, they said to the person, make sure they wear their mask. And I thought, oh, yeah. And they came and tested uh, 16 um, areas in my house. Uh, they didn't check the wall linings, which I've got a big concern about. Um, so I might have to get that done myself. But I, um, yeah, I just... At one stage, they were taking some, a sample close to me and they weren't wearing their mask. And I said, shouldn't you maybe wear your mask? And they put their mask on, you know. But I, I was just reiterating that as far as the macho image because I get that, that sort of behaviour because I see that regularly. And um, I always think to myself, well, I don't really want to be putting myself at risk if I can help it. But there's still this macho type of image that um, like you're talking about, that, yeah. Yes, okay. yes, and in fact my whole comfort level, as I say, has shifted a bit. Um, in the past I was encouraged, and initially um, straight after the quakes, to facilitate people to do their own work as much as possible, but I've moved well away from that now and I like to encourage people to get professionals in. We had a similar question earlier on today about that, where a chip was taken and they were concerned about the residue. Um, a small quanti quantum like that, I would I'd put it in a bag, put that bag in another bag and put it in the rubbish. Not a problem. Okay. Um, anything bigger in, in terms of you know something b the, the size of what you're holding there, a piece of um, pole light or something, yes, you should take that to Bromley Eco Centre and dispose of it there. But again, it should be in a bag, which is in another bag, and preferably a polythene one. Um, and twist and seal the, the neck and either tie it up or use rubber bands, label it as asbestos and take it to Bromley. It sounds like a bit of overkill, but in actual fact, um, the asbestos regulations apply to any contractor that's doing work, and they are specifically required to um, uh, treat asbestos in that manner, and I, I don't see any reason why the average householder or do-it-yourselfer who's um, brave enough to, um, t t to tackle it themselves shouldn't ha uh, shouldn't take similar precautions. Good on you for confronting them about the mask. I think that that was the advice I gave to the um, the person that, with the, a similar question earlier on. 
go back to the company and question question those behaviours. No reason for for that sort of um, carry on. The, the the thing is, they're really affecting their own health as well, potentially. Again, I say um, their um, the concern is there that they'll go to the next house and and exhibit the same behaviours and put themselves in the same risk again. So. And on a daily basis, if they're doing that 10 times, they're, they're elevating their risk every time. Your risk in terms of one little chip, probably minimal. In fact, to date, we're not aware, and I'm quoting Alistair Humphrey, the medical officer of health here, we're not aware of any environmental exposure to asbestos having caused any form of asbestosis in terms of the general populace, right? So it may have happened, it may be hidden in, you know, people have um, uh, COPD, which is an, um, a pulmonary disease, or they may have asthma, or other, disease, uh, other illnesses that disguise the fact that they've got a bit of asbestos but, or asbestosis, but um, it's, still, it's still not a risk worth taking. Okay, thank you, Tony. That's right. Oh, hi there. Um, I had um, brick repairs done to our home and that involved taking the old bricks down. And when the old bricks were taken down, they were just knocked down with sledgehammers. So what that did was it broke the suffete uh, above where the bricks were. And um, so it would have been about maybe s up to seven linear metres of damage was done. And then also when the brick layers were putting up their profiles for the new bricks when they were putting up the aluminium extrusions they were scraping the suffete and um, they caused damage to it as well in terms of scrapes and they also cracked it sort of the size areas yep. and probably about four or five corners so anyway um, our homes our home has been repaired for about two looks one of those extended ones where it's been yep. two years so initially, uh, I was always telling people that the suffit was an asbestos risk, and pretty much no one wanted to know about it. Like people were hearing what I was saying, but no one wanted to know about it. So later on, you know, all of a sudden people started to get interested in it. So in any case, um, when when the repairs were um, repaired, when when that suffit was repaired, it was patched up as though it wasn't asbestos, so the repairs were done as though the material wasn't asbestos. And so what I'm wondering now is, what is the status of those repairs? And um, let's say they were done wrong. Um, is there any recompense to address that, you know, mistakes were made and, and how those repairs were handled? Okay, well... Um the first question is, was asbestos testing carried out? Um, well, I remember I told you that I told people that... that you, you, initially you believed said, it may have been, but oh, did, well, what, was so there a, I, I an actually, actual test? When, when I spoke to um, the, super, the supervisors who came around, they'd all say to me, no one's told me it's, it was asbestos. So later on, when I actually got the information from EQC, I actually saw that uh, in the forms that they fill out... That, that very first form, it was written down that the asbestos, that the suffit was an asbestos risk. So the information was on the files. Of course, risk isn't necessarily an actual hazard. Oh, it's yeah. a possibility that it was, and a lot of suffits are. They're often made with a, a bonded type of asbestos. So I'll, I'll just carry on. So in any case, um, eventually testing was done. And it was identified as being um, in the second highest risk category. So it wasn't at the highest risk category, but the next one down. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Yes, well, n now you know, and you can do something about it. I mean, that's that's the essence of it. And uh, again, I would suggest going back to the um, the uh, the company involved would be a first step. But I'll just hand across to John. He might have something to say about it. So this was a Fletcher's repair? Yes, yes it was. Um, so I think that you raised two issues here. And the first issue is whether or not 
asbestos regulations have been complied with, and I understand that Fletcher's have their own asbestos policy. So one of the things that you could do would be to ask for a copy of that policy and just compare what the policy says with what actually happened on site. And then I think you probably need an assessment of whether the site is safe in its current state because if it's not safe, then it should be made safe. And so that would be a conversation to have with EQC. So obviously that assessment is going to involve costs. So how is that going to be sorted? Um, well, I think you'd want to ask EQC to meet those costs in the first instance, especially if the asbestos policy has not been complied with. And if they say no, then you probably need to seek further assistance, either from an organisation like the Residential Advisory Service or from a lawyer. Yeah, sure, OK. Um, I feel like I, I ought to mention it. Um, Yeah, um, as I was saying, I feel like I ought to mention that the man who um, did the repairs on asbestos when it wasn't recognised as a risk, um, I actually found out that he um, ended up dying from cancer. So, you know, I think it's quite alarming. And um, I just thought I wanted to mention it. Thanks for that. Yes, um, of course, it's not to say that um, he, he died from an occupational related, but uh, it's possible. Um, it is, it, it's a worry, but any time there's a contractor working, the jurisdiction is with WorkSafe New Zealand, who used to be Osh, of course. And if you've got a, um, concerns over procedure, um, and or even if you're concerned with the, the procedure that you you have described to you, you can always get another opinion from WorkSafe New Zealand, and um, you can ring them any time, and they they they're always accessible. Um, 0800 030 040, and they'll 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 um, advise you directly on the um, on the asbestos regulations. So most of the Disposal. If, I'm talking mostly if you're doing it yourself, you have to, you're taking it to Eco Central. Um, at, sorry, at Bromley, and from there it goes to Cape Valley, where there's a large cell and proper disposals affected there. But a lot of the um, contractors also use um, Cape Valley, and another group that's monitoring demolitions within the city that you may come across from time to time is called the WEMP team. The Waste Environmental Management Team, they're a combined ECAN and CCC initiative and these chaps go out where they, there are problems or people have concerns about the way that um, asbestos material is being handled or work has been done on a property. I was out uh, with some early this morning just looking at a, um, a, a property where uh, on, on one, we were visiting one property and it was all being controlled, the proper signs are all in place, people are wearing the right equipment, safety gear, and right next door there was a, a homeowner doing his own work and it was a shambles. And um, we wouldn't have found out about that had we not been at the first place. But it, it is a concern that so many people are um, ta taking their own um, work into their own hands and, and attempting to do it. I, I, I consider it a major concern. Any other questions about asbestos? Because I'll move on to mould now. Sure, thanks, Sarah. All right, okay. Um, mould, again, we're once again, the, the quakes have um, precipitated a lot of um, change of processes and gaining of knowledge around mould. We've always known that 
molds are ubiquitous. There's lots of species in a, in a household and in Christchurch and around the world. We have um, uh, quite quite commonly in, in Christchurch in wintertime issues with temperature and humidity inside um, houses. And I'm getting quite a few calls on mould issues. And often uh, people, particularly tenants rather than homeowners, but um, saying I'm, I'm living in a uh, terribly damp and uh, mouldy house. There's a lot of uh, old liquefaction underneath the house and I can't, I can't seem to get on top of the mould. So we're working constantly to try and move people f away from those environments, particularly if they are vulnerable, children, people with, um, who, who might be immune compromised because they're ill in some way, elderly, um, pregnant people, thing, thing, things like that where we, we, we're attempting to find better accommodation or give them the advice they need on how to deal with mould. Now, it's a, 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 um, moisture's the big culprit. People have wet areas, um, steam from laundries and bathrooms. Everyone knows about uh, mould in the shower and that sort of thing. But what we've seen post-quake, of course, is the, the liquefaction come up and affect whole houses and it, it become a, a far more um, serious situation. And species such as... Um, Stachybotrys, which is known as black mould, which ironically is green and slimy and not, not necessarily black, um, have been raised as a bit of a spectre. And a lot of people mention black mould as if it's, um, uh, you know, it's, it's going to kill them. Well, it can. That's the catch. Um, particularly if you're one of those people that has uh, uh, respiratory um issues or if you're in a grossly contaminated environment, so you're, you're bedding or the curtains around you and your habitable areas is, is grossly contaminated. So again, it's a question of uh, if you've got a serious infestation um, of having to uh, get rid of the mould yourself or do you call an expert in? And the general advice I've been reading suggests that you're better to call an expert in if you've got more than three areas of mould over uh, patches over um, half a metre square. So um, it's just a rough estimate, but it's indicative of you're having a systemic problem with mould in the house. Of course, you can look under the house um, or in the in the attic. Those are good areas. Um, if if the the liquefaction's under there, then uh, still under there. It should by now be drying out, but we've, what we've seen is a shift in, um, well, you can see on the maps over here, um, the ground elevations have changed, water tables are up, and even some tidal areas are, 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 are um, affecting houses around Christchurch. It's all about controlling that water getting the water and the liquefaction out from under the house and a proper insulation in the house to 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 help keep it uh, warm and dry when you are adding heat. So you've got relative humidity, um, moisture source in the house and most adults will know to open windows to keep, keep the house um, dry. We see in Christchurch and particularly in older houses, but also in some modern ones, um, rivulets of water running down the walls and windows, indicative of the need for a dehumidifier or um, at least having um, a constant source of background heat. The problem with that, I guess, is that the, the heating bill goes up and it's, it's difficult for particularly people who are stretched financially to keep the heaters going in the background. So we have a um, we have an advisory service, and there are other. Uh, when I say we, there's a, a, um, a community public health and the city council, um, myself included, will visit properties and advise on that. But there's also energy um, action uh, who. who will 
assist with advice on insulation and curtains and so forth. Um, Mould is ubiquitous and there are surprisingly no standards about it. It's one of the, the ironies that because it's ubiquitous around the world, even the World Health Organization, um, the, the documents they have on mould um, uh, are few and far between. There's a lot of debate about setting standards around the world and some countries including Canada have, have had a crack at it. The, the problem being you've got the susceptibility that ranges from person to person. Uh, a fit person can put up with a certain amount of mould but an ill one can't. And then you have um, highly variable indoor environments. The air quality varies throughout the world and from temperate climates to tropical climates you get changes in things like relative humidity that affect the growth. In, in Christchurch in New Zealand we don't have standards that we can apply but we use guidelines that particularly where there's visible signs of, uh, of mould that we will um, suggest actions to remedy it. If it's structural, we can approach the landlord and deal with it that way. And lastly, if, if the person is susceptible, we, we ask them to, to often get tests or go to a doctor. So we have to balance a number of factors here, the, the actual structural environment, the way that people live and their susceptibility. So um, I can see why the World Health Organization has shied away from setting specific standards other than for laboratories and so forth on mould. And it makes it very difficult when people ask me what level of mould should I look for in a, in a, a dwelling or a building. Um, I've generally suggested that they get the mould tested if it's affecting their health and speak to um, expert analysts in some of the... Um, some of the environmental firms in Christchurch actually will take samples, send them away and give um, do analysis also on levels of humidity in the home and how to, to overcome that. So it is a complex situation and I've, I've covered a number of things but I think I'd rather be guided from any questions that people have on mould uh, for the next bit. Any questions? Um, my, um, sorry, I, <coughs> excuse me, I live in Darlington and my house is not fixed yet. Um, the liquefaction has been removed. So it's um, a concrete ring foundation with um, brick, sorry, wooden framing and summer hall stone and concrete tiles. On all of the interior walls in the house, you can see all the ribs and um, a guy came round from a mould company and suggested it was dust and damp from the outside that's um, showing up, um, you know, all up, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Of course, there, there can be internal sources of that moisture which move by capillary action through the, the wood, but there can also be, particularly when diurnal changes in temperature in a day you can see we go from freezing to 20 degrees practically in, in one day um, that the internal linings have to cope with quite a bit and they the the air temperature and moisture level in the air will migrate sometimes to structures within the wall so there's an external um, moisture level as well and Dust, well, at the moment, the northwest is kicking up. There's just dust everywhere. Um, but that can be normal ambient uh, migration of household dust. So technically he's correct, but I wouldn't want to say which was the leading cause, whether it was an internal capillary action from the, the structures or um, external from the ambient um, moisture content in in the air, and I, I would, I'd be honest, I'd defer to an expert on that. Um, who would you recommend to get that check? It, um, it definitely wasn't a problem before the earthquakes. Sorry, um, you, I don't think your microphone's quite... Sorry, um, it wasn't a problem before the earthquakes. There are gaps 
pretty much all around all the windows. Right, it wasn't a problem before the quakes. Yes, okay. You've got you've got to just continue to go back to to the company demanding satisfaction. But I my um, instinct is to hand the microphone over to John, who's <laughs> looking at me. Yeah. Um, thanks for that. Well, under the Earthquake Commission Act and also under insurance policies, the question for damage is whether it's natural disaster damage. And so that becomes a question of what is the cause of the damage. And sometimes it can be hard to pin down the cause. And there's a whole body of law over called the law of causation, which is really quite complex. But in some situations, it might be quite easy to identify the cause. And, but a cause doesn't have to be the sole cause and it doesn't have to be the major cause, but it does have to be more than a minimal cause. And sometimes it could be a situation where the fact that there is more cracking or there um, might mean that the risk of damage happening is increased, and in some situations that can be sufficient as well. So um, it can be quite a complex question whether it's a sufficient cause to justify an earthquake claim. So the um, contractor was at my house today and his recommendation is that after they do a repair, you know, level the house and put insulation and lots of stuff, that should clear up. Do you agree with that? To be honest, there's only one way to find out. <laughs> there's, nobody can give you a guarantee one way or the other without actually I think what he's saying is logical and should work but will I give a hundred percent guarantee that it will work um, there might be other variables at play and as John suggests um, it's difficult for us to even in these relatively scientific times to be a hundred percent sure about such things I, I guess the thing that I don't want is that you know as part of the scope they're going to be painting all the walls don't really want what could be a problem painted over it and then in a couple of years you've still got a problem that... True, true. Um, again, I, I can't answer that, I'll, I'll be honest. Um, that, that I think time will tell. As long as um, you're following the, the, you know, the, the materials dried out, that you're following proper construction processes, it shouldn't be a big problem. The advice on mould is that um, some moulds do persist, they form spores, and some of them go on to form what's called, what are called toxins, and they're, they're even na nastier. But it's, it's not an exact science about which moulds will do that and when, or what, even what species is. And it's so many species that, of uh, mould that, from, from the mould in your cheese that you enjoy through to the blue uh, uh, rhizobium type uh, mould that grows on. On pumpkins, <laughs> right through to the the more insidious uh, aspergillus and uh, statubotrys ones that we've we've already talked about, the black moulds, um, and to say th this will probably occur or probably won't occur is, is problematic. I'm afraid. <laughs> not, not, I'm, I hate to be um, you know equivocal about it, but that, that that's a fact. You you do your best, and you do have to monitor it and be ready to go in there and um, take action if you're seeing mould growing in one particular area, so as you do in the, in, the, in the shower, you know, you get out the exit mould or um, a, a dilute chlorine bleach. You can even, if you're a greenie, you can use um, uh, white vinegar and uh, it's a little less irritant to particularly people or children that might have asthma or something like that. Jump in here. Um, under the Building Act 2, the defect liability period for building work has been extended from three months to 12 months. So that's for any building work that was carried out after the 1st of January of this year. And the other point to note is that the Limitation Act gives you six years after the work was carried out to raise a complaint against a contractor. Any other questions on mould? Um, just to give you some background, um, we were recently 
advised to leave our house overnight because we have very high levels of Stachybotrys and Aspergillus um, spores. Um, the situation that led to that is damage from the quakes causing the collapse of a fractured uh, Lois bank underneath my two-storey house that's set into a cliff. And as a consequence of that, water and mud flowed through the ground floor of the house for the last, I don't know how many years, <laughs> probably from the winter of 2011 onwards. Um, we're in a situation where we've had to leave behind all of our contents. Um, it's interesting that the insurance company certainly accepts that the mould is a direct consequence of the earthquakes. And our journey to get to this point has been, shall we say, interesting, um, with EQC assessments that definitely did not recognise there was any structural issue whatsoever. Um, my issue and my question is, the mould testing that was carried out in order to determine those levels of um, toxins and, and spores was only done in two areas of the house. And as a consequence, the insurance company are only looking at repairing, demolishing the back wall of the house and repairing those areas where they tested. My argument is that I would imagine after the length of time we've had with water flowing actually through the house um, and trying to control it ourselves as best we could, but nonetheless difficult, I'm very concerned that there will be mould um, and also some of the, the timber rotting bacteria that they identified growing in other parts of the house as well. And the opinion of my builder is, is the same. Um, we probably need to actually progress to demolition. We're close to that with the repair costs at the moment. Is there some way we can get further testing? What can happen for us that might help? Please. Sure. Um, do you know the company that did the testing initially? City Salvage. Right. I'm not familiar with their level of accreditation on mould. Um, as I understand it, they're fully accredited laboratory for mould, asbestos, etc. Um, it's quite probable that they engaged um, um, a certified laboratory to do that work. So that's your main level of confidence there. Where I think the system falls down a bit is there is no standard for mould and there's no procedural standard for how to go about um, assessments or um, uh, even reporting on mould. And it's one of the problems you can imagine I have myself around this. I basically have to make it up as I go along based on the best science that I can find in my, in my experience. But um, it is problematic, I think, as I said right at the start, we are gaining knowledge every year that passes and I think you've every right to go back and ask the hard questions of both the mould testing company and um, uh, the, the city salvage people themselves around their procedures. In terms of other companies that, that can provide that, there's a range of those in and are on uh, the net on Google and I think I've, I've got three or so in the um, pamphlet that I've got here but you, you could pick anyone from the yellow pages. The questions to ask are really about the certification of the laboratory, what standards they, they're using, typically they'll be Canadian or Dutch or, um, standards but they're derived um, independently and I, to say they've got no status in New Zealand's uh, um, uh, probably not correct. They, they're regarded as suitable guidelines. I think if they were to stand up in court and say, "Well, these are," we regard these as suitable standards. I'd, it wouldn't be many people who would argue against it. Um, but that's the state of the play at the moment. We don't have a New Zealand gold standard that can apply. I'm sorry about that. It's not your personal fault. It's of interest to note that although the insurance company fully accepts that the, the water flowing through the house has been the cause of the mould, EQC um, are reluctant to admit that our contents claim should be um, validated because they're saying they're not sure whether the mould has, has arisen from this blooming great hole in the back of the house. <laughs> and, yes, um, and that can be... 
it can be a long time before um, the structure fully dries out. I've been involved in the Southland floods years ago and uh, it took many years for, for some of the houses there to dry out properly and ongoing problems with mould. What we found was the simplest approach was to just rip all the soft furnishings out and um, ve ventilate the house as best we could um, right through the middle and underneath and um, dry it out. I don't. I haven't seen that occurring a lot in Christchurch, but um, it's a more extreme approach with where you're just dragging everything out. But it has happened in flooded areas and in some, um, uh, of course, in some um, quite quite affected areas as well. Um, it's possibly also of interest to note that there is mud built up underneath the floor. The floors have rotted out in part of the bottom part of the house and the mud is built up to within this distance of the floor as I found out when I fell through it. Um, yes. Fortunately, it didn't break an ankle because the mud was so close to the surface. Yes, yes. Um, and, and it will... Um, you need to know what, what the mud was. Is it liquefaction? Is it clay? Is it... Um, that's know? lowest mud that's been oh, brought okay. down by the rain. So it's clay, so... Um, it will it will retain a lot of moisture. Yes. yes. Um, again, probably not something that a, a humble environmental health officer can give you much advice on. I'm sorry. Well, thank you for your efforts. It's appreciated. Any other questions? Oh, hi again. Um, I had some mould issues um, again related to earthquake work um, because. I had a damaged um, kitchen drain pipe that was not identified because assessors were not um, crawling under the house to look at damage. They were only shining torches from the manhole. So um, in any case, um, that damaged pipe caused mould behind um, on, on the outside of the wall where the brick cavity is. And so I actually did uh, email you and got you to come out and have a look at that. And you actually said to me, um, good luck trying to get EQC to do something about that. So I'm just wondering, has the City Council, um, ha can people, um, has that changed? Can people um, expect to get support from the City Council uh, in terms of matters relating to asbestos and mould um, yeah. if they're battling EQC, EQR? Yes, of course. We, um, we're here to give that advice. And yes, it is difficult to prove. Um, that that was a direct result of the quakes, but that's um, that's a specific issue. John might have more to say about that, but oh, I'm, yeah. I'll I'm just carry on. Since then, I've actually um, had professionals come in, uh, decontamination medics, and they um, their opinion was that it was earthquake related and to do with the broken pipe. So, so there was two types of damage. One was um, rot and one was mould. Um, my concern with the rot is that I understood from reading that some types of rot, once established, they don't actually need moisture to uh, stay viable. They can create their own moisture as, as, they, as they live. So what concerned me was that um, because the areas were in, in dark areas that you'd never access, this could be just a huge ongoing problem that you'd never aware of. That's right, you're talking about things like uh, rising damp and dry rot and some of those other building ones. I do recall advising you to use a company like uh, Decontamination Medics so that you could get that level of advice on whether um, that w exactly what the causes were. And yes, you're quite right, um, you can have ongoing problems. I'm yep. not here to <laughs> deny so, that. So even though I've got uh, Decontamination Medics involved, um, EQC still... Um, declined that is um, being earthquake related so they have I, I, I asked them the basis of why they've declined it I haven't got a reply from that but I'm just wondering oh, where, where do I stand now right so you're still waiting um, I might get John to uh, answer that um, for an EQC decision with which a homeowner disagrees one tactic or strategy that might work is asking for the reasons for the decision and the information relied on because in your particular circumstances if the information does not carry as much weight as the information that you provided that would suggest that the decision should be reviewed.
And I'm just, uh, thanks for that for both of you. I'm just wondering, is that something that RAS would be able to provide support on if homeowners are experiencing an issue or is there, is that a, a possible service that they can go to with that? Um, absolutely. Yes, okay, that's great, thank you. Any other questions? All right, so thanks very much, guys. There's some really excellent questions that have come out of this and thank you very much, Tony, for coming down and speaking about that and to our panel for being present.